Today's video is sponsored by Energy Sage. Visit the link in the description below to find out how Energy Sage can help you contract local verified solar experts to help you generate clean, green, renewable electricity for your home, either through solar panels on your own home or by joining a community solar project in your region. In the Inflation Reduction Act that passed last week, there was some pretty huge news for EVs, for clean transportation and for the environment in general. So even if you all hate politics, this one is worth sticking it out for. And for those of you who love a bit of political wonkery, I'm going to break down what this bill is trying to do, what it means for the average Joe or Joanne looking to green their transportation, and for those folks outside the US, what this means for clean transportation and climate change in general. So let's start with the 10,000 foot overview, or I guess that's 3,048 meters for those in metric countries. This bill called the Inflation Reduction Act, yeah, I know we got the name wrong in 10, that's our bad. This bill is a compromise wrought between progressive Democrats and essentially Democratic Senators Manchin and Sinema, who, alongside the entire Republican caucus, have blocked attempts to reduce US dependence on fossil fuels and expand clean energy and clean transportation funding in the US, citing concerns about spending and taxation. But in Senator Manchin's case, it's probably also related to the over a half a million dollars he made in 2021 from Enner Systems Inc., the coal brokerage business he founded. And while the Inflation Reduction Act contains a vast number of pieces addressing everything, from the government being able to negotiate prescription drug prices to funding the IRS to increase its audits, the bit we're really going to concentrate on is the clean transportation section. Although we'll delve a little into the clean energy section because, well, we're us. It also, thanks again to Senator Manchin's hard work, contains some concessions to fossil fuels which it's thought will mean that about 2% of the bill's impact is potentially lost. But hey, it got the bill through, and a compromise that gets something this big through this Congress is better than not having the bill at all by a long old way. And still, it suggests that we might be able to avoid a visitation from Ambassador Odin, like they had to have on Peliarzel 2, I mean, it'd be nice if we can sort this out amongst ourselves like grown-ups. So let's start with the biggest news, the sort of expansion of the EV tax credit. As it stood before the passage of this bill, a tax credit of up to $7,500, depending on your tax liability, was available to purchasers of new electric vehicles produced by manufacturers who had yet to sell 200,000 plug-in vehicles. That meant that for companies like Tesla, GM, and most recently Toyota, who've all sold more than 200,000 plug-in vehicles, granted in Toyota's case not fully electric ones, the credit would ramp down to zero, potentially placing them at a significant disadvantage in the marketplace. The Inflation Reduction Act tweaks that tax credit by deleting the 200,000 vehicle limit and replacing it with a universal expiration date of December 2032, which on its face sounds excellent and which has the potential to massively increase the number of vehicles that are covered in the long term. But there are some significant caveats. But before we get to them, let's have a look at what this bill is trying to do. This bill, at least the bill as a whole, is trying to do something pretty epic. It's trying to make the US into a leader in green energy and transportation. It's trying to bring manufacturing back to the US, to make the US a place to make solar panels and wind turbines, and to make it the place to build EVs, and to do all that it needs to encourage companies to build a massive manufacturing base, and the expertise to innovate here, and make all this stuff here. It does that through including apprenticeships and prevailing wage requirements to make sure that the US builds an increasingly large, skilled workforce of folks with well-paid jobs. It also does it through tweaking the tax rebates and incentives for manufacturing and for the installation of clean energy generation to markedly increased levels for installations using equipment produced within either North America, the USA specifically, or for things produced within countries with which the US has a free trade agreement. 
It's super cunning and super complicated and beyond the scope of this channel to cover it all, so check out the video link below to the Vlogbrothers if you want to look at some of the other things that it does. It also adds in a cool $3 billion for the US Postal Service to transition its fleet to clean vehicles. The decision by Louis DeJoy, current head of the US Postal Service, to update its fleet with initially around 90% gas fueled vehicles, although that was later shifted to around 50%, was widely seen as a proposition that would hobble the service long term, with expensive and difficult to maintain and expensive to operate fossil fuel vehicles. It also placed the Trump era appointee at odds with the currently Democratic Congress. By providing funds to electrify the USPS's aging fleet, it creates an enormous US market and fleet of battery electric delivery vans and removes the excuse used by DeJoy that the upfront cost is too high for the post office. But that's just a drop in the bucket of this bill, which also incentivizes a bunch of energy efficiency improvements for homes, providing funding for low and middle income households to add heat pumps for heating and cooling, and water heating. It adds funding for improving homes insulation, and of course, encouraging solar installations. Homeowners could get up to 30% of the cost of home solar back at tax time, retroactive back to the beginning of 2022 and running through 2032. After then it tapers down for the next two years. The same incentive will also apply to energy storage for your home. And all of that brings me nicely to today's sponsors, Energy Sage. Energy Sage is an online service in the US that helps homeowners connect with local, verified solar installers who really know their stuff and can help you navigate the process of installing photovoltaic solar panels on your home, or can help you join a community solar program. Transport Evolved used Energy Sage when we were looking for installers willing to help us put solar panels on the roof of Nikki's home, and our Energy Sage verified installers were professional, knowledgeable, and even put us in touch with an amazing credit union to help us finance our solar panels for as low a monthly payment as possible. And with the US federal tax credit for solar panels boosted back up to 30% for panels installed in 2022, now is the perfect time to plan solar for your home. Many Energy Sage installers are now planning out through the end of summer and into the autumn, so if you want to get panels on and take advantage of the best of the sun this year, time is running out. Follow the link in the description below to sign up for Energy Sage's free, no obligation service today, and if you choose to use an Energy Sage installer for your solar project, we will get a small referral fee, so you'll be helping us too. Okay, let's get into the weeds a bit with what this bill does for EVs, since I know that's what y'all want to know. First, as you may have heard, there's the addition of the price and earnings cap. The price cap varies by vehicle for vans, SUVs, and pickup trucks. The maximum retail price for the vehicle is $80,000, and for quote, any other vehicle, it's $55,000. There have been a lot of angsty words written about this price cap, and for some smaller automakers like Rivian and Lucid, it's certainly disappointing. But if you're spending $80,000 plus on a pickup, or a good chunk more than $55,000 on an EV, then I'm not wholly convinced that a $7,500 rebate is going to be top of your list for deciding factors in that purchase. The earnings cap varies depending on how you file your taxes. For those who are married filing jointly, or for a surviving spouse, the earnings cap is $300,000. It's $225,000 for a head of household, dropping to $150,000 for anybody else. There has been also a lot of virtual and physical ink spilled by folks declaiming that this is a terrible change. And again, we're not so sure. The oldest and most polluting cars tend to be driven by the lowest earners, also the people who are most likely to be commuting long distances from cheaper suburban and extra-urban properties to jobs in areas where there's poor public transport provision. Getting those folks into EVs is definitely a priority, as should be improving public transit, and hopefully this will help make the tax credit more readily available to those folks by encouraging the sale of lower-priced EVs. That said, it's still a tax credit. You still have to have sufficient tax liability to get the funds, and unlike some other tax credits, I can't see any change to allow this to be spread across multiple years for those with a lower tax liability. 
which is disappointing. However, it looks to me like it will be transferable to the dealership, allowing it to be offered at the point of sale. We'll have to check back on that when it's signed into law and the law of the land, though. Until President Biden signs the new bill, the old tax credit is still in place, so if you're looking to cash in on the seven and a half grand discount on your Lucid Air or Rivian R1T, now's the moment to buy it. Once it's signed into law though, the number of EVs that qualify for the discount is going to drop precipitously, at least initially, which is a very unfortunate side effect of the long-term plan pooching the short-term need. And this is perhaps the most challenging bit, because while there's not really a problem in trying to incentivize domestic EV manufacturer, the domestic manufacturer and materials restrictions are likely to be incredibly challenging for manufacturers to meet for the next few years, and it's almost certainly going to lead to confused and frustrated consumers who don't understand why one car qualifies when another does not. Within the bill, the former $7,500 EV tax credit is now split in two, and half is allocated to the origin of the quote critical materials, and half allocated to where the battery is assembled and its components manufactured. If we're getting deep into the weeds, a percentage of the minerals must be extracted or processed either in the US or in countries with which the US has a free trade agreement, and it also must not contain any minerals from quote, countries of concern, which includes both China and Russia. Russia incidentally tends to be a source of nickel, and China processes the vast majority of the world's lithium. The bill also does allow for recycled materials which are recycled in North America. That content percentage increases year by year, from now until 2024 it's 40%, but it increases rapidly to 80% in 2027. Moving on to the battery, which is where you get the other half of that $3,500 credit, we're looking for assembly or manufacture within quote North America, so Mexico, Canada or the USA. Again, we have a percentage increase to track, starting this time at 50% for vehicles in service before 2024, bumping up to 100% by 2028. In the medium term, this is going to be a messy situation, particularly for manufacturers with factories both inside and outside North America, where it's possible the same model of car could be eligible for a tax credit when it comes from a North American factory, and not if it's shipped from abroad. Unsurprisingly and unfortunately, the immediate impact of this bill is, as I said, an actual reduction in the number of EVs eligible for the tax credit. Indeed, the list of vehicles which might qualify is now pretty tiny, although it should be noted that in certain trim levels, the Tesla Model 3 and Y will finally be eligible for the tax credit after a very stint with Tesla having no tax credits. Unfortunately for Hyundai Kia, none of its vehicles will be eligible, nor will any BMWs, and of course the Toyota BZ4X and Subaru Solterra are also excluded. Many of the vehicles which might be eligible for the credit, like say the Cadillac Lyric, they're not actually available in significant numbers yet, so hmm, it's probably gonna stay a bit of a mess. Now, while the bill has passed and will probably have been signed into law by the time this video is on your screens, there is a substantial probability that the European Union will bring these domestic content rules to the World Trade Organization's dispute resolution process. So we may well be revisiting these rules in 12 to 15 months time, because the European Union and EU-based manufacturers had already flagged these new rules as breaching existing WTO rules before the law passed both houses. And automakers outside the US are, shall we say, displeased at the protectionist aspect of the bill's structure. Unsurprisingly, it also discourages the entry of Chinese automakers to the US market, which will thrill some of you all, and not so much others who prize the budget-conscious price of Chinese EVs, which have really helped to drive down the cost of going electric in some other markets. On the matter of budget, or at least used EVs, there is, finally, a federal tax credit for the purchase of a previously owned car. That car has to be at least two years old, be sold by a dealer, and cost less than $25,000. 
and the credit as the lesser of up to $4,000 or 30% of the price. Again, it's got an earnings cap and it's a little fuzzy to me right now whether the domestic construction and content requirements might still apply. It's only been a weekend since this bill was passed and there's only so much time to digest a 700 page document that references a bunch of other massive documents. When we're sure of the answer on that one, we'll let you know. Okay, so things are going to be kind of hinky with the tax credit for vehicles and yes, for a bit things aren't going to be so rosy for the range of EVs available with a credit, which is annoying and frustrating. So in that case, why are we pretty excited about this bill as a whole? Well, it's really a joined up effort to tackle climate change. It uses mostly carrots to encourage transition without penalising folks at the lower end of the income scale. And by including funds for home efficiency improvements, $8 billion of them, we might actually make a substantial dent on the US's carbon emissions. Now, the so-called budget hawks who seem to consistently preside over massive increases in the deficit have whined about spending in this bill, but independent analysis has suggested that over the bill's period of action it will actually reduce the deficit by around $260 billion. It will however probably have a negligible effect on actual inflation, ironically. But honestly, I'm not that bothered about that. Money's no use if we can't live on the planet, so we need more? But the fact that this got through our divided and dysfunctional Congress is enormously good news, not just for us in the US, but for everyone around the world. Because you all may have noticed, we all live on one planet, so if one country is not doing its bit, we all get to suffer. Also, if we can get this through, maybe Europe can get something it's equal or better through, and we might, just might, avoid the worst that climate change has to offer. That's it for today. Thanks for joining me and see you next time. If you liked the video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and sharing it with your friends. And if you really liked it, why not leave us a super thanks? It's easy to do and everything you send goes towards helping us make great content. If you haven't already, make sure you're subscribed to this channel and our other channel Transport Evolve Take 2 and give the bell a gentle ring to make sure you're told when our next video goes live. And thanks to our video's sponsors, Energy Sage. Check them out at the link below. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew go out to everyone who makes TE possible. That includes everyone who supports us on Patreon and YouTube, as well as those of you who just watch and share our videos. If you're a supporter at the charged up level, you'll see your name here on my right. And if you just joined, we're sorry if your name isn't showing. We currently render the list every week or so, but sometimes our videos are produced a few weeks in advance. Thanks to our self-driving tier supporters, Chris Maxwell, Pedro Muro Pinheiro, Patrick Boyarski, Bennett Elder, Brian Newton, David Kitchen, Michael Goad, Ricky Leong, Andrew Martin, Guido Drahota, Brophy Wolf, Tessa in the Gong, Gordon C, Stephen O'Donoghue, Kyle Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Rajin Fellows, Dan Blair, Jim Burness, Chris Asenta, Chris and Michael Johnson, Peter Dillinger, and Denny Hyde. And of course, out of this world thanks to our Starman supporters, Anonymous Freak, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, Rory Litwin, Joe Bresney, Reed R, JP Fagerback, Russ, Will Grayland, Matthew Drobnak, Blue Says Hello, Kevin Burrowbridge, John Lyons, Andrew Glenn, Paul Conway, Laura Reynolds, Ellery Hensley. There's Ellery Hensley, and then there's someone else. There's someone... There's, there's someone else. You just, yeah, just someone else. Oh, oh yeah. There's Ian. Ian. Thank you, Ian. Want to be part of that amazing list? You can join Patreon at the link below. Hit the join button below, down there, to support us on YouTube or show us your support through Bitcoin, Kofi, or our cool swag store. Links are all down there. And if you're unable to support us financially, know that watching the video and sharing it makes a real difference to our ad revenue and keeping the ever hungry algorithm satiated. Thanks for joining me, and as always, keep evolving!